So, uh, Daniel, the um, immigration obviously has been, um, in many respects, the the founding of this country and uh, the um, uh, the 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 building of this country. The dynamics of immigration, uh, you write, uh, have basically uh, been with us for an extended period of time. The the ugliness that we're seeing. Uh, now, uh, just this week, the Supreme Court allowed for the uh, Trump administration to uh, put um, uh, restrictions on uh, who can immigrate, uh, or who can uh, get permanent status in this country uh, based upon their ability to to pay for things, regardless as to whether they're working or not. Um, give us a sense of, of what, you know, let's start at 30,000 feet and then we'll drill down into some specifics, but give us a sense of what, uh, what the, the, the general dynamic has been in regards to immigration in this country. Well, the 30,000 foot view or maybe the 100,000 foot view is that migration has always been a central point of political conflict in this country. If you think that it started as a, about how it started as a settler colonial enterprise, which involved moving migrants from Europe here so that they could hold land that was dispossessed from indigenous people and then that enslaved Africans were brought here to, you know, do the most degraded, hard farm labor. And then that continues throughout the, the 19th century when, you know, we have uh, attacks led by states like Massachusetts on poor Irish paupers. You have Protestants who, who hate these poor Catholics coming in. Then the late 19th century, huge anti-Asian, specifically anti-Chinese sentiment. One of the first federal anti-immigrate anti-immigration laws, period, is an anti-immigrant law, the Chinese Exclusion Act, targeting Chinese laborers, banning them from the country. Over the decades that follow, Asian nationality after nationality is banned. Then in the 1920s, amidst, you know, the eugenics and World War I era first Red Scare, we have the national origins quotas passed, which sharply restrict immigration from Southern Europe and Eastern Europe, targeting Italians, targeting Jews who are seen as a threat to the, the, the white Protestant United States, who's brought in to, to do low-wage labor in the booming Southwest during this period when all of these other people are getting shut out? Mexicans. And Mexicans are not seen, they're seen as, uh, according to the Dillingham Commission, this commission in the, the 19 teens that lays the groundwork for the national origins quotas, as, as, as better, some, uh, this is not a precise quote, better as laborers than as citizens, but fortunately they'll go back home. But what happens is, throughout the mid-20th century, Millions of Mexican laborers are brought here at the invitation of the U.S. government and business through a massive guest worker program called the Bracero Program. And that institutionalizes Mexican labor migration into the United States. And what happens a few decades ago, starting in the 1960s and 70s, is that that ongoing Mexican labor migration is suddenly criminalized and declared illegal. And that's sort of the beginning of the story that ends well, it doesn't end, but it's punctuated by the 2016 election of Donald Trump, the most anti-immigrant president probably in American history, which is saying a lot because there's been a lot of anti-immigrant uh, presidencies in our history. All right. So we, we have like, you know, basically um, two different dynamics. One is more, uh, I guess, generic with the uh, the immigrant villains changing. And then one is a, a different story in terms of um immigration that 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 at least um uh, comes via mexico and i would imagine you know also includes um central americans so let's let's take the the, the sort of the generic relationship to uh to to migrants in, in, into this country what 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 is that dynamic i mean I, I you know there's we have this ongoing um in this era this ongoing sort of question about um you know how uh materially based is racism and xenophobia what is your take on this dynamic what is creating this hostility um this sort of there's a there's a push pull sort of dynamic um that is um that is operating it seems to me with uh migrants particularly obviously in migrant workers um Give us the sort of the, the generic, and then we'll talk more about that sort of the dynamic with uh, with uh, Mexican and Central American labors. Well, yeah, I mean, 
as you just mentioned, since especially since the 2016 election, there's just been quite, there's just been this question: Was Trump elected because of economics or racism? And I think the question, the debate is sort of really poorly, misleadingly posed because the answer is inextricably, fundamentally both. Look at this yeah. recent public charge rule, which is simultaneously targeting immigrants and the welfare state, and that's targeting poor migrants as a manner to target non-white immigrants. So just in this new public charge rule that, that Trump just won this big Supreme Court uh, victory on, we're seeing that they're, that they're one and the same. And we can go back to the 1990s when the anti-immigrant movement as we know it today really explodes on the national scene with the passage of Prop 187 in 1994, this California referendum to deny social services, including public education, to undocumented immigrants. This is the same moment, you know, leading up to the passage of welfare reform in 1996, which of course is based on the pathologization of, of poor black welfare mothers as these irresponsibly reproducing uh, parasites who are taking from, you know, hardworking Americans. That same narrative, which is simultaneously attacking both the welfare state and racial others and using the racial othering of those people to attack the whole welfare state, that's going on with immigrants in California. So it's economic and racist at the same time. Time And that's definitely what we're seeing with uh, throughout the 1990s. There's all this anxiety with the end of the Cold War. The U.S. is suddenly the sole superpower in this unipolar order. But instead of this being like this really huge victory, it seems uh, like very uncertain for a lot of Americans, especially with the onset of, of, of corporate globalization. As we've come to know it with NAFTA, there's a lot of anxiety about jobs heading south and drugs heading north along the border across the U.S.-Mexican border and what both right-wing nativists and the Republicans in Congress in California and the Clinton administration do is displace a lot of that anxiety onto the border and onto undocumented immigrants. They get scapegoated. And so anti-immigrant politics have for decades served as a way to legitimate a neoliberal status quo that's really bad for most Americans and say, and it's a way to say to people, like so many other things in our politics here and really everywhere, that you know the problem isn't the people at the top. It's your fellow worker who comes from some other place, who has a different skin color, who speaks a different language. So it's economics and race all, all the time. You were uh, making the point that the, the xenophobia and racism that we see at play uh, today and that we've seen over the past, I don't know, uh, several decades – um, has been almost an explicit tool, uh, particularly in regards of immigrants, to uh, attack the welfare state. And of course, simultaneously, and this is what I was trying to get at with this push-pull thing, there's a desperate need by um, capital and those who would cut the welfare state for this underpriced labor. But yeah. uh, they, 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 there's a there's like a trick here, like with it creating some measure of tension. Um, it it and it has two purposes. One is um, this tension it helps keep that labor cheap, but it also it provides the ability to attack the welfare state so that um, you're basically using immigrants and migrant workers as a mechanism to immiserate. Uh, American citizens. Um, but before we come back to that, because I want to talk about it, it's fa- uh, you know, fascinating, this, uh, the story of the Braceros. Uh, but early on, when we see this type of sort of xenophobia and we have that dynamic of, of capital needing really cheap labor, um, how does that play out there, that, that dynamic? It does, does, does sort of promoting that racism and that uh, xenophobia help keep help disempower these new migrant workers and how do they sort of like climb out of that scenario yeah i mean so the 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 anti-immigrant argument is that immigrants are cheap labor and thus undercut domestic labor but it's important that it's the combination of of the of the boss the capitalist boss combined with the repressive state that's declaring these these workers illegal 
that is cheapening their labor. And that's why we've seen the labor movement in recent decades come around to full-throated support of immigrant worker rights and legalizing immigrant workers so that all workers in this country can organize together against the actual person, the actual people and forces that are keeping wages low, which of course are bosses. But yeah, it's a fundamental contradiction here where you, where bosses need immigrant workers, but at the same time, they also need immigrant workers as a scapegoat for the social and economic problems that they're causing. And it's a contradiction that they can't always neatly reconcile, which is why, you know, it gets out of hand at times, like with getting Donald Trump elected. Donald, the people behind Donald Trump don't only want to, to, to end undocumented immigration, they want to end immigration across the board. And most immigrants in this country are not undocumented. And that's why, they, but they haven't been able to touch, ex except around the edges, like with things like this public charge rule, they haven't been able to touch legal immigration because at the end of the day, one, there's not a public appetite for it because for decades they've defined, they've used anti-immigrant politics as a vehicle to all ultimately get to shutting down immigration uh, as a whole, but it, they've become so obsessed, the politics have become so fundamentally about illegal immigration that now you have anti, if you ask your average anti-immigrant person, like, oh, why are you anti-immigrant? They'll say, I'm not anti-immigrant. I'm anti-illegal immigrant. I'm anti the people who come here the wrong way. It's fine if you come the right way. So they can't actually shift the debate back to legal immigration. It's that, and it's also business. In 1996, there was a bill uh, a major anti-immigrant bill that passed that was signed by Bill Clinton that is responsible for so much of the, the persecution of undocumented immigrants today called IRA-IRA. Initially, it was supposed to be both an anti-quote illegal immigration bill and an anti-legal immigrant bill. But advocates who were doing good work, plus business who had their own interests, together got the bill split and the anti-quote uh, illegal immigrant bill becomes law and the anti-legal immigration bill Become, goes nowhere. And attacks on legal immigration have gone nowhere ever since for just that reason. So this is like one of many cases where business in alliance with the, the right is kind of like riding this tiger. You know what I mean? They, they need right. the they need right wing politics, but it also can kind of take on a life of its own and get sort of scary. Um, but 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 it seems like at the end of the day, that business still has control over Trump because they don't they don't they don't really mind, you know, at the end of the day, Trump demonizing undocumented immigrants as long as Trump doesn't cut off access to legal immigration. And the business is not going to allow that to happen. And it hasn't happened. And so we see this like feeder of, of anti-immigrant politics, which benefits business because it it, it 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 provides a scapegoat and it cheapens immigrant undocumented immigrant labor. Uh, interesting. All right, so let's talk about this, uh, Braceros. It's it's fascinating. You describe it as a program that ends up institutionalizing uh, Mexican migration, and um, and then um, it, it, I mean, just explain what that means for people, because obviously there's no foundation for the uh, the immigration, but it, it it is setting up a sort of almost it's it's dictating the way that people grow up and deal with things in Mexico in some respects, and it's creating sort of traditions and um, I guess sort of just uh, uh, roots of people on some level that, that, that get hardened over time. And then it is um, it's undercut and it, whatever it has replaced or what other s solutions it provides for, for Mexicans all of a sudden goes away overnight. Exactly. So there are social networks underpinning immigration and patterns. And so people start coming. Millions of visas are issued under the Bracero program. And it becomes, in many parts of, of, of Mexico, a, a normal thing to migrate to the United States for work within different villages and different parts of the country. And, uh, you know, one person does it. And then, you know, maybe their, their son or their brother or their cousin will also do it. And they'll say, hey. I got a job in this place. And so that continue like you should come too, and that, that that that's a legal process. And then that continues even after Mexican migration is suddenly illegalized. So people kind of think of it as like, oh, 
you know, when did all these, quote, illegal immigrants start coming here? But there, of course, there are changes over the decades in in patterns and volume of Mexican labor migration to the U.S. But the big change that happens is not has nothing to do with Mexicans migrating. It has to do with with the U.S. government suddenly declaring that that stream of migration illegal. And then it becomes the specter of illegal immigration. And then the obsession with securing the border, which really explodes in the 1990s, because like just to give listeners context, in the early 1990s, there's just like there's almost no fencing on the U.S.-Mexican border. Today, we have more than 650 miles of fencing, in large part thanks to the 2006 Secure Fence Act signed by George W. Bush, voted in favor for by people including Barack Obama, Joe Biden, Hillary Clinton. In the early 1990s, we have a few thousand border patrol agents. Today, we have nearly 20,000. None of this stops undocumented Mexican migration. All it does is, a f- is, is basically two things. One, it pushes migrants into dangerous desert conditions in places like Arizona, where they die in large numbers. Right. Two, and this is truly perverse, it convinces many Mexicans who would have otherwise been circular migrants, come to the U.S. for work, then return to Mexico, then come back for some more work, then go home. It convinces them to stay put in what sociologists call a caging effect because they decide that it's not worth it to try to come back across. Um, so it's this performance to convince Americans that the border is secure, that really takes off under Bill Clinton. And in doing so, to an attempt to convince Americans that their insecure feeling lives are secure. But the performance never works because not only does it not is the border insecurable and you can't stop undocumented immigration like this way, that way, but the world is not made secure. People's lives are not made secure. And so the crackdowns, both in terms of deportations and border militarization, grow more and more extreme over time until Trump emerges with this fantastically maximalist solution right. of a literal wall across the entire border. Uh, it's fascinating stuff. All American nativism, a new book by Daniel Denver. Daniel, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. 